Traditionally, the spirit of the dead was believed to set in the west with the dying sun. It then journeyed into the nether worlds of the night where it would meet Osiris, the god of resurrection, and receive the power of rebirth. In the morning, as the sun rose in the east, so too the spirit would rise from, from the door of its tomb and come out to live among the living. This was the ancient Egyptian idea of paradise. Akhenaten, it seems, was quite prepared to undermine this cherished belief. The key to his view lies in the puzzling location of the royal tomb. The recent survey of the region reveals that it lies on the same axis as the temple to the Aten. And the valley that leads to the tomb is the same break in the cliffs, which to Akhenaten looks so much like the sacred Akhet, or horizon of the sun disk. The Akhet in ancient Egyptian belief was a place in which the sun spent uh, perhaps as much as an hour before rising in the morning. Now this was not just a zone of transition between the nether world and the world of the day. It was a place also where the sun received the final effective form that it needed to come to life again in the morning. The royal tomb was situated in the very birthplace of the autumn. Why? There's a clue in a major relief on the walls of the royal tomb. It shows the autumn rising in the ocket. Its rays radiate out, breathing life into every street and house in the city. The final piece in the jigsaw comes from the survey of the royal tomb's relation to all the other boundary markers. The tomb's position suddenly makes sense. The magical birthplace of the sun god and the royal tomb appear to be one and the same. The message was loud and clear. Akhenaten's soul would rise as one with the Aten, bypassing the journey to the underworld to meet Osiris, the god of resurrection. This was heresy and must have frightened Egyptians of the day. The common people, laborers working on this tomb, would have been very worried about what's going to happen to them in the next world. Where now is their guarantee of rebirth if Osiris is in fact non-existent, if there is no Osiris? Later dynasties branded Akhenaten a criminal as well as a heretic. Why? For starters, there are signs his final objective was to wipe out 2,000 years of Egyptian religion. The first casualty was the Opet festival in Thebes, with its pageant of statues of gods paraded from temple to temple along the Nile. Akhenaten canceled the ritual when he moved to Middle Egypt, which must have incensed the people and left a void in their lives. Perhaps even more offensive was what Akhenaten decided to put in its place. Another frequent relief found in the city depicts the royal family driving chariots. These drives were no Sunday afternoon jaunts in the country, but stately parades from temple to temple along the royal road. Instead of having processions of divine images, you're having processions of the king himself. That's a fairly meaningful act to swap the, the procession of the god for yourself in a chariot. There's no record of what people thought of their king's behavior, at least not officially. But this figurine of a chariot was found in the Amarna ruins, driven not by the king, but by a monkey. It's the only evidence of descent unearthed to date, surprising in light of the massive scale of Akhenaten's reforms. 
A close look at the chariot scenes reveals why. Armed troops escort every chariot procession, ready to squash any signs of protest. But even this show of force only hinted at the magnitude of Akhenaten's designs on Egyptian religion. After about 10 years in power, he issued the most brutal edict of his reign, the desecration of all the old gods of Egypt. Akhenaten attacked every shrine in the land. Back in Thebes, the god Amun bore the brunt of this backlash. In a fit of jealousy, without precedent in ancient Egypt, Akhenaten targeted every reference to Amun. It wasn't just the colossal statues that were damaged. Even in small scenes like this one, the god's face was hacked out. Inscriptions on the top of obelisks were full of references to Amun. Although barely visible from the ground, they had to go. A climate of fear now pervaded the land. This amulet was found in the ruins of a house in Amarna. It had a moon written on it. Its owner felt it was perhaps wiser to censor the word. There is, in the history of the world, a number of movements, communism, Nazism. I think they all, in the beginning, uh, infect people uh, with a new way of looking at things and bring people along with them. But it seems to be common human nature that eventually what is a liberating theology becomes restrictive. You can no longer accept alternative ideas. You must only accept one idea. And at this point, fanaticism starts. And what's interesting about Amarna is you can see it's starting happening in human history for the first time. This was the nightmare which later dynasties branded a heresy and a crime. This was the trauma they wiped from their history. How it came to an end and who erased the memory is shrouded in mystery. But here and there, one can still hear faint echoes of a violent aftermath. In his late 30s, and after 17 years of absolute rule, Akhenaten disappears from the records. No one knows what happened. The royal tomb was found empty. Some believe he was a victim of a plague then raging. Others claim he died a natural death. A new theory suggests he may have been the victim of a conspiracy. Kings were murdered in antiquity. In Egypt's case, the facts are sparse. But Nicholas Reeves, a world-renowned expert on the 18th dynasty, believes the possibility can't be ruled out. In the Middle Kingdom, the 12th dynasty, Amenemhet I was murdered. We have this, uh, we know this from a document, uh, a literary text. And we know also of a harem conspiracy against King Ramesses III of the 20th dynasty. Such things were, I suspect, not uncommon. Was there a traitor within Akhenaten's court? His successors would have had much to gain. No one knows who did succeed him to the throne of Egypt. One candidate is an obscure pharaoh by the name of Smenkare. Some argue that he was a younger brother or son of Akhenaten. But others claim that he never existed and that Smenkare was a pseudonym for someone else. It's only recently that we've begun to realize that, in fact, Nefertiti played a, quite a powerful political role. Akhenaten appointed Nefertiti as his co-regent to rule beside him um, partway through the reign. And the likelihood is that following Akhenaten's death, she continued um, to rule in her own right, adopting a new name, Smenkare. Whoever succeeded Akhenaten had a short-lived reign, dying soon after being crowned. 
What is known is the identity of the next pharaoh, a boy of nine who ruled Egypt for a decade. Tutankhamun's parents are a mystery. Many think he was Akhenaten's only son, born to him by a lesser wife. His fame today stems from the wonderful treasures discovered just over 75 years ago. It's thought that Tutankhamun died too young to play a major part in history, but the boy king in fact presided over one of the most critical periods in his country's past. As king, he faced an agonizing decision to champion his father's ideals or to steer Egypt back to normality. Which side of the fence did he come down on? It is known that the old religion returned during Tutankhamun's reign. This is the boy king's throne. It has a cartouche with his original name, Tut Ankh Aten, living image of the sun disk. But the other side of the chair shows that he later changed his name to Living Image of Amun, Tut Ankh Amun. Yet the restoration could not have been carried out by Tutankhamun himself. He was too young. The affairs of state were in the hands of a close relative, the father of Nefertiti, the officer I. It was he, a former ally of Akhenaten, who in fact renewed the cult of Amun. I was due to hand over power when Tutankhamun came of age. Instead, the boy king met a premature death and I himself acceded to the throne of Egypt. Tutankhamun died at the age of 18. The cause of his death is a mystery, but theories of foul play abound. One of the most sinister points the finger directly at I. What's interesting is that when Tutankhamun is of an age to entertain his own ideas as to how things should be. This is precisely the time when he disappears. These ideas may well not have fitted in with the way forward that I envisaged. Could it be that Tutankhamun was in fact very much a chip off the old block and the early death of the boy king saved Egypt from another round of heretical fantasy? And destruction. Tutankhamun's death proved a watershed. Pharaoh after Pharaoh obliterated the memory of Akhenaten and his heresy. The whole city of Akhenaten was dismantled stone block by stone block, leaving only the mud brick inner walls. Ancient Egyptians must have thought they'd heard the last of Akhenaten. But in 1907, excavators stumbled upon a strange royal tomb, not in Amarna, but in Luxor, in the Valley of the Kings. It was found strewn with broken furniture. Tomb 55, as it is known, dated from Tutankhamun's reign, so it must have housed a family relation. But who? The coffin was moved to the Cairo Museum, but it was impossible to tell who it belonged to. The mask had been torn off. Even the name had been chiseled out. There were no clues to its identity except inside. The skull and bones of an adult male First this. Was the body related to Tutankhamun? DNA tests on the fragile tissues have not yet been allowed, but Dr. Nasri Iskander was one of a team of forensic experts who compared an X-ray of Tutankhamun's skull, shown here on the left, with an X-ray of the mystery skull, shown here on the right. Now, this one is very close to this one. And according to the, some dimensions we are measuring and some angles of the mantle and some parts of, of, the, of this skull, we have found 